But national instruments, we have a wide variety of different uh, teaching solutions for all kinds of levels, from the very basics of the first ever classes you would sit in a graduate engineering degree for things like the frequency domain, all the way through Laplace transforms and other kinds of digital transforms as well, and hardware radio design, then up into the more common undergraduate classes like introduction to communication systems, uh, which covers the mathematical construction and different modulation schemes and how to do demodulation, how to do synchronization. Then we have uh, more advanced courses, often suited to postgraduate level study, which look into the all real world effects of having a separate transmitter and receiver, all things like carrier frequency offset um, and equalization that need to be done when a communication system is entered into the real world. And of course, it's all exactly the same hardware and software platform that scale all the way up into world-leading research and industry. So all of the skills, experience, know-how, and even in a lot of cases, the same code can be used throughout any level of this uh, experience. So let's talk about that end of the spectrum up in the research and industry. What is happening in the world of wireless communications today? Well, you'll hear a lot of talk about 5G and the Internet of Things. And these are two extremely exciting new areas uh, where a huge amount of investment and research money and grants have been poured into because making big in this space has the opportunity to really revolutionize the way that we interact with the world. Now, 5G is a particular effort to overhaul the mobile and cellular communications standards, and the 3GPP is the governing body, which is uh, probably the main contributor to that. Now, we have gone down the path with 5G exploration um, reasonably far now, and we're getting into definition phase. We have defined three main areas. We need to increase the data rate um, for high data rate applications, things where we may have multiple users in one space or may wish to get high fidelity data across uh, very quickly. Now, another area that we need to expand on is the number of connections that we can connect to. We're estimating over 50 billion devices will be connected um, in the coming decades. This is everything from not just cell phones and laptop computers anymore, but connected vehicles, uh, connected Internet of Things devices, home appliances, the factory of the future with connected um, devices, test beds, and tools inside. These number of connections and the type are going to be extremely large and varied. And then lastly, we need ultra-reliable communications in 5G. Uh, this is to enable things like autonomous um, agriculture, autonomous driving vehicles. At the moment, it's not too much of a problem if your cell phone call drops or if your YouTube video has to buffer. But in a safe, critical application, that's absolutely unacceptable. So we must build this high reliability and low latency into the system. Now, all of these areas need to be explored and prototyped and proved to work before they can be uh, added into the system. So let's take a look at where that comes in. Now, what you'll find is that maybe five plus years ago, wireless communications conferences, 5G conferences, uh, were very theoretical heavy, very paper heavy. You had people um, largely proposing new theories. But the landscape has changed. And now, in order to get into this later definition phase, you often need to be able to show a working prototype. That's because the people who are um, considering this definition phase are often needing to partner with industry and different companies around the world. And these companies um, are much more likely to trust and invest their money into a working prototype than they are simply an equation on a piece of paper. So if you want to be anyone nowadays, you have to show that your algorithm or your prototype works in the real world. And for that, you need typically a software-defined radio and a programming environment to go on top of it. Here at National Instruments, that's the USRP and LabVIEW Communications. So at National Instruments, 
we decided that 5G was an extremely broad set of different requirements and areas that needed to uh, be prototyped. And we decided to focus our efforts based on our experiences into four main areas. So we have massive MIMO, uh, advanced wireless networks and new network topologies, uh, multi-RAT and enhanced physical waveforms, and then millimeter wave as well, which is up in higher frequencies than traditionally used for wireless communications today. Let's take a look at the first one, which is in massive MIMO communications. So what is massive MIMO? Well, here you see a classic setup with perhaps a, what you'd see on a cell phone tower today. Cell phone towers are often split into three different um, angles, if you like. You have a separate antenna serving each area. Now, if you can only serve one channel from that antenna, you can only serve one user, and you can only bring in revenue from one user. Um, what Massive MIMO is looking to do is to actually increase the number of antenna elements on the transmitter and receiver. So if we increase the number of elements, what we're able to do is something called beam forming or beam splitting. So this now allows us to split our energy and direct it towards certain parts of the cell by using the characteristics of the phased array of antennas. Now what we could do is using exactly the same channel, exactly the same frequency and bandwidth and all the specifications, we can focus that energy out to perhaps two different users, for example, or at least a, a small number of users. And as we include more antennas, into our transceiver system, what we can do is inc uh, increase the amount of beam forming that is, is available to us. Uh, we can essentially narrow the beam. If we can narrow the beam, we can serve more users, just like you can see here. So now all of these users are on the same channel, the same frequency, and the same uh, specifications, but they are being spatially multiplexed. What this means is that using one base station, you can now serve an exponentially large number of users on the same frequency than you could before. And that's important because frequency and the number of channels that you have available to you are one of the single most expensive entities of running a mobile communication system. The spectrum um, controlled by different spectrum bodies, depending on which country you are in, in the world, is often extremely sought after and a very scarce resource. So that's massive MIMO, using multiple antennas to do spatial multiplexing. So who's doing massive MIMO using national instruments equipment and where do your students find employability uh, having developed efficiency in the national instruments platform? Well, you can see here a number of different names. We have both universities and industry partners, some of which um, who are in, in a very competitive space, so don't wish to be named. And there are more people that are on these slides, but these are some of the first um, adopters. And you can see the likes of uh, Facebook that we'll talk about in some more detail here, and a number of different universities spread around the world. And we'll look at Bristol University in some more detail as well. So Facebook has just announced Project Ares on their technical section. And Project Ares is an effort in order to get wireless out to more rural areas and to give high speed uh, connectivity to those areas of Vogue. Now, Massive MIMO focuses the beam um, on the antenna. So what that allows them to do is to actually increase the power of the overall uh, phased array and to effectively push the wireless signal further because that energy is extremely focused. Um, it, uh, you can imagine it like a spotlight compared to a much wider bulb um, spreading the same amount of energy over a far wider space is actually dimmer. So you can imagine this, this wireless waveform getting further. They also have a, a very keen interest in spectral efficiency as well. Um, 
seeing as, as Facebook is coming into this area, they will have to go through the uh, process of competing for Spectrum with the existing incumbent uh, mobile providers uh, that are out there today. Now, massive mine often operates around, um, say, the 100 antenna per transmitter or receiver base station. And it's often implemented on the base station uh, because it needs a lot of processing and a lot of raw power to run. So looking over now at the uh, number of antennas, you can see that the Facebook Aries system is using 96 antennas and can service 24 users. Um, there was a, a fantastic time where Facebook and Bristol were competing for the world record for spectral efficiency. Now let's take a look at the Bristol system. Bristol came back with another world record breaker in this, um, this battle between these two gigantic um, powerhouses of, of knowledge and, and efficiency. And they were able to achieve 146.4 bits per second per hertz of spectrum used. Now, they have an 128 antenna system, and they can service 22 different mobile users using that prototype system at any one time. So these would be, for example, 22 mobile phones or perhaps 22 automated um, factory uh, moving components, for example. Let's take a deeper dive to the Bristol system. So the um, the head of the the system here is Professor Mark Beach, and he has been working with us very closely to develop a framework of code so that other people can use that framework called the National Instruments Massive MIMO framework in their uh, efforts to to prototype one of these systems and can essentially get a head start in the code development by working on what Bristol and the University of Lund before them have helped us develop. Now, this system uses a 20 megahertz spectrum, which is very typical of, sort of the LTE or even earlier than that with uh, 3G and 2G systems um, for mobile communications. And within that, they were able to transmit 1.5 gigabits a second, which is orders of magnitude higher than uh, LTE or, or even the previous systems before that. Now, 128 antennas are connected to 64 USRP Rio uh, systems that you can see in the racks in the picture there, and the laptops in the front, each one is connected to another USRP Rio acting as the um, user equipment or essentially mobile phone, the user receiver in this scenario. This is the architecture of the system. It's, uh, it's not as complex quite as it looks. You have the different antennas grouped up um, and they communicate via PCI Express back to different uh, PCI Express switches. All of this data is aggregated at a PXI chassis ready for um, the digital signal processing and, and handling to occur. The digital signal processing um, on the host is reasonably minimal because that job is handed out to the FPGA chips on each of the USRP rears and grouped accordingly. So some of the demodulation is done on one group of FPGAs, uh, some of the synchronization on another, some of the pre-coding on a, on a separate group of FPGAs. It's a, a very intelligent system of distributed computing. Okay, so let's move on to talk about somebody else in the MIMO space, not quite massive MIMO, but full dimension MIMO. So we looked at an example where we could use MIMO in two dimensions in order to service different users in a classical scenario where the users are people with mobile phones walking around a two dimensional uh, space being served by a base station. But as our urban infrastructure and our cities grow and become more complex and we find wireless communications in more and more modern environments, we don't just have to think about two dimensions, we can think about three dimensions as well. Now, Samsung worked with us in order to develop a FE MIMO system in real time, which it was the first real time prototype of any FD MIMO system. And they were able to use our LTE application framework, um, which is part of uh, an add-on for library communications that gives you a fully working 
um, LTE downlink and uplink ready for you to build upon. So they were able to take that as a stepping stone and then focus on implementing the FD MIMO part of the overall system. Now this show was on at NI Week in 2015 where they brought it up on stage and if you want to see more information and see that system running, you'll be able to find it on YouTube. So that's Massive MIMO. Let's keep on moving then and talk now about uh, some advanced networks. So National Instruments partnered with Intel in order to uh, investigate something called CRAN. Now CRAN is a cloud radio access network um, and it's cloud because the digital signal processing and a lot of the um, usual computation happens at, remotely in the cloud instead of at the base station. What you can see over on the right hand side is the system that Intel have built. So they built a massive MIMO uh, base station out of USRP RIOs and what they have done is kept the digital signal processing on that part of the system at the bottom of the diagram that you see there in white with all the antennas attached. They've kept that DSP fairly minimal and pass the data um, back for aggregation to a PXI chassis, which is the uh, aggregation PXI FPGA that you see there. Now what happens is that all of that data is streamed over Ethernet to Intel Blade servers, um, which will then do the, the actual overall DSP and management of this uh, new network topology. This comes with a whole bunch of benefits because this server could essentially be anywhere in the world and it also means that you don't have to do so much digital signal processing on each and every base station so you're saving on computation um, resources that would otherwise have to be distributed. Also it pr can enable much more advanced forms of DSP on the likes of things like supercomputers and super server centers. So this is really quite exciting stuff where we could um, you know, take wireless communications and into the realm of being software driven and software defined and then leverage all of the efficiency and management structure that comes with that. <clears throat> Lastly, let's take a look at one of the most exciting areas right now, which is seeing again a huge amount of investment um, and research money and a great number of growing jobs in the market uh, for those who, who are proficient in it is millimeter wave. So millimeter wave is the use of frequencies which are typically far higher than we have ever considered for normal communication systems today. Normal communication systems tend to operate in what is known as the sub six gigahertz band. So this is anywhere from really naught up to about six gigahertz. And if you think about all of those different frequencies, you have FM radio at several tens or maybe a hundred megahertz, um, AM radio around the same space. You then move up and you get things like GSM, which is 2G mobile phone. Uh, operating anywhere from 850 through maybe uh, of megahertz through to maybe a thousand megahertz, which is one gigahertz. Um, 3G and, and 4G mobile phone then operate at very similar frequencies, if not a little bit higher, with the highest LTE standards um, going up into the low gigahertz. And when we get to 2.4 gigahertz, that's where we hit one of the ISM bands. Now these are the largely unlicensed bands where you find all kinds of modern technology operating like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other non-contact uh, forms of communication. Moving up further then, um, we think about maybe things like um, military communications happening around the three gigahertz area and up then into another ISM band at 5.8 gigahertz, which uh, again, you find many modern Wi-Fi systems operating at. However, millimeter wave is now looking to uh, move outside of this very crowded, incredibly expensive sub six gigahertz spectrum, uh, which has been pretty much filled up with all the different technologies that we've mentioned. 
What it's looking to do is work up in the tens of gigahertz, uh, which the technology for transmitting, receiving, and processing at has, has now become a realistic uh, capability. And these are typically unlicensed or just becoming licensed bands. One of the huge benefits that we can get up at millimeter wave frequencies is huge channel bandwidths. Um, bandwidths of you know one gigahertz or multiple gigahertz, uh, which you know really gives the opportunity for massive data rates. The problem with millimeter wave frequency is it's a whole new area of the electromagnetic spectrum that we have not experimented with a great deal and needs a, a huge amount of experimentation and proving out in order to find out quite how a communication system behaves at those frequencies and how the electromagnetics behave with things like reflections, phase differences, uh, phase jitter and error. Um, how does temperature, how does cloud cover affect millimeter wave? The other challenge with millimeter wave is that it attenuates very quickly in air. So Typically, these um, systems that are in use today are being used for point-to-point -point communication between two static um, antennas. Maybe this is for things like backhaul over a network or building-to-building -building, uh, communication, and typically over short distances. What we would like to do is be able to bring millimeter wave to the typical cellular communications, mobile phone, uh, maybe connected vehicles type of area. Now, up until we partnered with NYU Poly, we hadn't really done any um, credible investigation on modern communications uh, waveforms and what they do up at millimeter wave frequencies like 70 gigahertz or so. And that meant that we couldn't say exactly what the complex uh, changes and value changes within the complex waveforms of a modern communication standard would do. So what we did is we partnered with NYU Poly and Ted Rappaport, who made some of the first ever um, credible modern communication standard experiments in this field. And he used the area around his university, which is New York City, in order to get a very real scenario um, to see exactly what reflections and, and problems would occur. And those measurements, those channel um, measurements that were made, are now being used as many of the talking points in the 3GPP standard discussions uh, where they are trying to go into definition on what 5G will look like in the future. Another customer who has worked with us on millimeter wave is Nokia. Now Nokia are one of the most well-known mobile phone providers in the world, but they do more than just the handset side of things. We were working with them on a base station that could possibly communicate at incredibly high data rates using those wide channel bandwidths. Um, and the first stage was to get a point-to-point -point communication going that perhaps could even break world record. And we managed to do exactly that. So we have worked with Nokia since uh, 2014 when they made their first millimeter wave system powered by LabVIEW and the NI millimeter wave platform. And they were able to achieve 2.3 gigabits per second um, over a point to point link. Then things developed from there and they kept on building on the platform. And by NI week 2015, they were able to take their millimeter wave from one by one, SISO or one antenna on the transmitter, one antenna on the receiver, they took it to MIMO, so two by two, and were able to get 10 gigabytes per second, sorry, gigabits per second, which was the world record at the time. Since they've managed to push things even further, and at Mobile World Congress in 2016, they brought the same platform back after even more development and investment and showed that they're able to now make 14.5 gigabits per second.
So as you can see, as we walk through these four main areas, massive MIMO, new networks, multi technology, and millimeter wave, there are a huge name of incredibly big players working in this space using LabVIEW communications and the USRP in order to prototype their systems so that they can become part of the next communications revolution. And LabVIEW really stretches across all of these different areas. These are just the ones that we have chosen to focus in. There's a long tail of other varied applications out there in the world as well. And it really doesn't matter what the actual hardware platform is from USRP, maybe it's PXI for aggregating data or for high-end instrument quality measurements, or even on personal computers um, and mobile devices, LabVIEW can help you target whatever it is that you need to use to prototype your system. So I encourage you to go online and take a look at some of these fantastic setups that are being put together using LabVIEW and LabVIEW Communications and to encourage your students to investigate all of the job possibilities at the absolute cutting edge um, in using these tools. Thank you very much.